Father, we give you glory and praise and honor because of your heart toward your people. Lord, throughout all generations, your purposes, your plans, your hopes, your intentions for your people have not changed. Looking back on the, the generations prior to their own, the apostles took observation, Jesus himself, observation of, of Israel and the many generations that preceded. Not only of the people, but of your work in their midst, Father. And they heard the, the words of David who said, the law is perfect and it is good and it is righteous. But the weakness of it was in the weakness of man. His inability and unwillingness to be led, to follow, to trust, to obey. The very things that the same same people, the, the patriarchs and David, those who you set to lead your people, the writings of the apostles, the very things that they said, this is the heart that I desire, that God desires. Humble, contrite, willing, teachable. Lord, this is the heart that we desire to have. Yet many times it becomes crowded out. By the desires of this world, the circumstances of life, the need of the moment. Lord, we hope and we pray that we might be able to learn and apply your wisdom. As the young ones prayed this morning that we may be able to practice your ways. Learn of your heart. Rejoice in hardship. Knowing your goodness and your grace and your strength abounds even in our weakness. So, Lord, we pray for that wisdom, for that strength, for that knowledge. That we too may have your joy, your peace, your righteousness. That it may become for us a living hope. Lord, I bless each one here, and each family represented, that they may draw near to you. With an all willing heart, Father, <clears throat> we pray that our children may walk in your ways. And Lord, that they may be curious about them so that they can learn
Pray that you will show them favor according to your will. And Lord, we pray for the body, the corporate body of Christ, Lord, that we may in this time make a step, a forward movement into maturity. Lord, through repentance and faith. Turning away from all former things. Striving forward to the joy of our salvation. Even our redemption in Christ Jesus. For which we give you all thanks. And it is with thanksgiving that we pray. Mm. Amen. Amen. Go ahead, brother. You have any thoughts? Please continue to share. So. <clears throat> uh, when you were speaking earlier, you know, uh, about <clears throat> a time of God's grace toward former ways. Yeah, I was thinking of um, some some spiritual seasons, you know, and <clears throat> kind of equating those to a natural um, illustration. Uh, you know, we, we speak many times of the farmer's wisdom and uh, – You know, there, there, as the scriptures say, there, there's a time for, uh, there's a time for sowing. There's a time for reaping. <laughs> there's a time when the the seed is scattered, and there's a time when the, the 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 planting is watched over. There's a time when there's an examination of the fruit. And I sense that, you know, along with the the idea that the grace of God is, there's a shift. Many times that shift has to take place because man stays in one place. You know, the, the grace of God produces a work in the midst of men's hearts. And then, you know, it either man tries to create something out of it or some movement happens and it stagnates so quickly. We can see that through the the many generations of church history. So you have the giving forth of, you could say the seed, God having made a preparation in the hearts of both individuals and, and, and peoples through the truth that he dispenses uh, in this, in a similar manner of, of casting the seed or planting. It is rather foolish to think that God as the, the great sovereign and divine gardener will not come back to take view of his planting. both in the individual life as an individual work unto salvation and, but also throughout the ages uh, toward mankind. And, and I think we, we are all familiar with the, um, the illustration that God uses, you know, there's kind of a dual illustration, many throughout scripture, obviously, couple of scriptures that came to mind one is in isaiah four and five and as a very different picture of what 
the planting of God had become. But prior to that, you know, early in chapter four, the Lord describes what his planting was to be. So in Isaiah four, he speaks of the the branch of the Lord in verse two. In that day, the branch of the Lord will be beautiful and glorious. And the fruit of the land will be the pride and glory of the survivors in Israel. Those who are left in Zion, who remain in Jerusalem, will be called holy, set apart. All who are recorded among the living in Jerusalem. The Lord will wash away the filth of the women of Zion, and he will cleanse the bloodstains from Jerusalem by a spirit of judgment and a spirit of fire. Mm. You know, interestingly, this judgment of spirit and fire, they come at the time when the fruit is born. And only when the fruit is produced can it be examined. Jesus gave very similar Parables, illustrations. The Lord will create over all of Mount Zion and over those who assemble there a cloud of smoke by day and a glow of flaming fire by night. Over all, the glory will be a canopy. It will be a shelter and shade from the heat of the day and a refuge and hiding place from the storm and rain, you know, a picture of what God's people are to become Mm -hmm. and to be. And especially in the production of their fruit. And we know that because the, the illustration takes a turn here as an examination of Israel's condition. Yes. In the time of Isaiah, but I think that these, Particular prophetic words are directly about. So seasons and planting seasons, they come and they go. So too are there spiritual seasons in a similar manner that God releases a certain grace to the earth and to mankind. And it, uh, he comes back to take observation of it. You know, we would be very unwise to think that this kind of examination was only taking place at this time in history and, you know, lock ourselves outside of a principle, a spiritual principle of God's work in the midst of man. When when he would see them come to his designated end according to his design and sovereign will. So we need to see what is mentioned here in in chapter 5, not as an examination of Israel at that time, but as an example of how God examines the work and the grace that he has given, the seed that he has planted in the midst of a people at any given time. This love song of God is one that is un, it is unceasing. <laughs> it's without end. And it is one that is always not only longing with its desire but also evaluating and judging whether or not the desire is met, is fulfilled. So reading in in chapter five, I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines the choicest vines, the purest truth, the most sincere desire. 
clearing the way. He built a watchtower in it, cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop, fruit. And what did he hope for? A particular fruit. And a very specific quality of fruit because of the purity, the nature of what he had put in the choicest vine. Well, we should expect that the choicest vine is chosen because it can produce the best fruit. He looked for a crop of good grapes. But it yielded, it produced only bad fruit. It yielded only bad fruit. So there's the illustration. Now God's asking of man... What do you think? How do you judge this? You dwellers in Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for Good grapes, why did it yield only bad? So he goes on to say that he will destroy the vineyard. And then in verse 7, he says, The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the house of Israel. And the men of Judah are the garden of his delight. And he looked for justice, but he only saw bloodshed. And he looked for righteousness, but he only heard cries of distress. Turn with me over to Matthew chapter 7. Jesus gives some parables, some teachings. Obviously, he starts with judging others, and he talks about good gifts given, the good things given from God to his sons. He says in verse 11, if you then... Though you are evil, know how to good give, give good gifts to your children. How much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Good gifts in this context are not just to show generosity and favor. In the same way that God giving the best that he can to his vineyard is not simply so that that plant can enjoy the best soil and sunshine and rain and place and protection, but so that it can produce for the gardener, for the father, something good for his use. I mean, all of these things are before the wine is even given to anyone. It can't even be used that way if it's a bad fruit. The father raises the son with every intention that he will take his son under his arm of apprenticeship and teach him the skills of the trade. 
and the engagements with others. And he provides him every good thing to enable it. Continuing, Jesus in 15 of chapter 7 says, Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit... You will recognize them. I know that he specifically speaks here of, a, of false prophets, but there's a more general principle as well that the apostles took in their teachings as well, hearing Jesus' own exposition of truths that were multi generational, <laughs> things that God had been speaking about for many, many, many generations. He goes on to say, well, there are people who think that they have a fruit, something to offer to God because of the things that they have done in his name. God essentially says, that's not how I evaluate fruit. That's not how I determine whether a fruit is good or bad. So when God comes to take observation, I think that we are in a, such a season, not only individually, but also, and very importantly, as, as uh, well, I'll say the whole world is in this position. But the question then is, in the midst of mankind, where, in, among whom, is the fruit to be born? Well, all through the scriptures, again, God says, it's supposed to come from my people. They are the ones who are to produce the fruit, the shelter, the leaves with healing, The food for the nations. How many generations has God come in the season of examination and said, there's nothing to offer the nations. There's no good fruit. Now this, I'm not sharing this so that maybe there is a measure as Brother Manuel mentioned earlier, of self-examination that we have in this, especially in relation to the former things and what God wants to produce now. But I think looking ahead, if we, if we cannot see and truly desire and search out and seek as to how, if the fruit that God desires is a culture in a people. If that is the fruit that is born in the midst of a people, that then he, God himself, not man by his great missional ideals, can take to the world. But what God, he's the master gardener.
the, the wild and unruly plant, he cuts back. But in the same way that we have said, you know, when and how and does not Jesus deserve the reward of his suffering? Does God not deserve to reap to take joy in his labor? throughout the generations? And do we really, in our own hearts, do we really desire what God desires? That may be the great test because many or all have a desire for what God gives and how it may benefit or bless us personally, our family, our ministry, our ideas even our ideas of how we serve God. But in the end, how does it, how does God get what he desires? You know, this is the true nature of a living sacrifice. What is truly pleasing to God. Why is a humble, broken, contrite spirit and heart so desirable to God? You know, we, we talk about uh, the, in, from a farming standpoint, a, a, one of the words that is used for the abundance of a crop is its yield how much did this plant or this area, this field yield? What did it give? <laughs> did it meet or exceed the expectation of the farmer? Or did it simply enjoy the sun and the water and the, 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 the care that it received, but did its own thing. Well, that's not a good crop. And God is, I believe, at a time again in the world, in the season of the earth, where there is a great examination of the people of God and what the fruit in their midst is. And that is the true separation of the wheat and the tares. And even in that, God's not, the harvest isn't the end. <laughs> what is to be done with what is harvested? God still wants to, to do that. And how does he see fit for that harvest to be used and distributed to the nations. Again, and I'll, I'll finish here, but I, I think that we need to really consider and examine the truth that we have so carefully and consistently touched on to the point of what may seem like over repetition. And it's not the repeating of the idea, the word, or the concept of the culture of God's house that will accomplish it. But if it is indeed the fruit that God desires, the good fruit, then we must make every effort to make that the highest goal and prize. The great treasure of God's house. 
and God's people. For one another, from God, and to all creation. God has not been unwilling. He's not a, he's not a, a, um, a, a farmer or gardener who neglects the work of his hands. Mm. He's very careful with it. Very near to it. So the yield and the yielding many times is the, the, the great determiner of what kind of fruit is produced. <laughs> 